Can you hear me? I hope everyone had an excellent lunch. We're going to get started uh, with a great panel. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to hand to Martin in a moment. Um, Bill Chin, if he's in the room, was to introduce this panel. If he's not, we're just going to get going all on our own. <laughs> Bill's oh, here. Oh, Bill's right here. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> no, you don't have to. You don't have to. We're good. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll just turn it over to Martin and you thank can you. invite up your panelists. Thank, thank you, you Matai. Um, thank you folks for coming so promptly for lunch. If you thought that last panel was good, wait till you see this panel. <laughs> really terrific. Can I, I ask them to come up please? We've got Jane, uh, Robert should be here, Andy, Robert's there, Andy, Pl oh, Dr. Plump. Trying to get his volume higher, probably. Um, um, and Matai, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. Why is that? <laughs> Just stolen my first joke, Stelios, but thank you. <laughs> it's my ambition for Andy to be on every single panel at this meeting. I think we'd all value it enormously. Um, as you can see from the panelists, a great group of people. We've got a couple of, um, I think in America, the politically correct time is seasoned professionals, and Andy, who's been with us for many years on this panel. Mitai, we allowed to have a sabbatical for a couple of years, but he's back again, also seasoned. Um, and then Robert and Jane, uh, here for the first time. Delighted to, to have you both. Uh, thank you. Um, Karun always puts this panel on after lunch. When you might be thinking that your energy levels are low, this will pick them right up again. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to the panel. They'll give a very brief introduction. And then uh, I'm really looking for audience participation. This is such a great chance to have such four exquisite leaders uh, up here. So please gather your questions as we go along. But first, I'm going to just ask for brief introductions uh, along the panel. Jane. Hi, yeah, thanks for inviting me today. I'm a newbie to this panel as well. So Jane Grogan, I'm the new head of research at Biogen. I've been um, in the shop, in the seat for five months now. So um, I know everything about the company. <laughs> um, prior to that, I'd been through a number of uh, startups as CSO in the cell and gene therapy space. And prior to that, I worked my way up the ranks at, at Genentech. Thank you, Jane. Robert. So, so Robert Plenge at Bristol Myers Squibb. Like Jane, I'm new to the panel and also new to my role as head of research at, at BMS. Uh, before that, I was at Celgene, and before that, Merck, and before that, I was actually in academics for a number of years. Thank you. Matai. Matai Vamman, I'm the CEO and chair of Fug Pharma. Uh, super cool, very interesting company in Cambridge. I can tell you more later. And uh, prior to this, I was the, the head of R&D at J&J. Uh, &J. Hi, I'm Jay Hi, Bradner, you. Jay Bradner from Amgen. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Michael Dolston from Pfizer. <laughs> Actually, I was having lunch with Dina Katabi. I don't know if she's here, but she stepped out. But she said, man, you guys say the same thing all the time. It's getting so boring. <laughs> I think that's because I'm just on every panel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can okay, you? we'll pass that one. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. We'll, uh, we'll pass by that one quickly. Michael's a good friend, but there you go. Um, and, and I think when she was speaking, Andy, she was really just referring to you rather than the panel about being a bit boring. Um, so as I say, I'd like this to be uh, highly interactive. I also try to get ideas that have happened this morning. I think all the panels were terrific this morning. And this piece about R&D productivity came up in a number of areas. And so I would like to ask the panels, you know, the, um, some of you will know, some of you probably won't because you were listening to the panels, but the Deloitte report came out today, the kind of annual report they put out about innovation shows the cost of a medicine is staying about the same, 2.3 billion. It shows the return of in innovation may have gone up a little bit. Um, interestingly, the average forecast for the new medicines 
is pretty stable, around 300 million, believe it or not. So it's all affected. So think about that. Think about the promise of artificial intelligence, you know, on R&D uh, productivity, and just your feelings from a company perspective, you know, where's your thinking now? Many years of trying to, you know, bend the curve. Robert, I'm going to start with you. All right, so I'll start with the R&D productivity uh, question. Um, and you know, I was reflecting on the panels from earlier this morning, which were awesome. Um, but it is amazing that we live in this very paradoxical time of all of the science and everything that's actually happening in our industry, yet we don't seem to be changing the R&D productivity curve really at all. And I'm sure there are lots of different explanations for that. Um, and I know that lots of people in this room think about all the different explanations. But you know, it does strike me that kind of the fundamental kind of unit is probability of success in clinical development. And that, that is the place that we should really focus on understanding why that we're not productive in that particular space and how do we actually increase that, that productivity. And so for me, as I think about that question, I try to boil it down into kind of three key themes. The first is around um, picking the right targets and really thinking deeply about uh, human biology. I know some of the panelists, we talked about genetics, but longitudinal profiling, human pharmacology, different ways to actually get at causal human biology, so not just correlated biology, but causal biology. Um, and then second, all the modalities that we have to actually go after uh, causal human biology, and I think there's just been an explosion in the last you know, decade or two to be able to actually match a therapeutic modality uh, to a molecular mechanism of action, whether it's in cell therapy, biotherapeutics, mRNA, nucleic acid therapies, et, et cetera. Um, but then really, I, and I think uh, this is where a lot of, I think, basic scientists sort of miss the connecting what's happening in basic science to what actually has to happen in clinical science and really having a very clear line of sight to that inflection point in clinical development. You say your drug is working as you predicted mm -hmm. and you can actually see it become a medicine. And I think that's a really special part of what we actually do in our industry is taking that basic science, turning it into a medicine and then seeing for the first time, oh my gosh, the drug is working and we think we actually have a molecule. So really it's about prob probability of success in clinical development. I think those three features, you know, causal human biology, matching modality and mechanism, and path to clinical proof of concept, I think if we can really anchor on those, I think we'll increase probability of success. Good stuff. Thank you, Robert. Jane, four or five months in the job, please. So um, I concur with all of this. I think it's, um, you know, if you look at the numbers that came out in the Deloitte paper today, right, so R&D productivity is up from 2023 over 22, like from 1 point something percent to 4.1 percent, which is down from the year before actually yep. at 6.8 percent. Um, AI is yet to reveal itself. And so what's going on and how can we actually increase these numbers? And we've heard a lot about this today, but I think to this point that keeping your eye on the unmet medical need is really the only thing we need to be doing to create um, the opportunities, then align that with the best modality, and then and then if we get that science right, making sure that we can test this in the, clinically, in the clinic with a fast proof, to con proof of concept trial. So what does that mean? It means really having a biomarker enabled um, program so you can kind of, what do they say, quick to win, fast to fail kind of approach. And so um, as we think about our portfolio and how we're growing this too, it's making sure you can measure target engagement quickly, safety and biomarkers early on in clinical trial. And, and the other thing I think personally, and I'll be a bit provocative here, is that um, I think something was mentioned earlier before by Noba around um, entrepreneurs create value and companies actually build that value. Um, what we often do in the industry is that we all jump onto things because they're new and exciting, and that's great, right? right? Where there's platforms that emerge, CRISPR is exciting, AI is emerging as a way with which we can prosecute biology and develop new targets. We're also lemmings. We also often go after the same thing because everyone else is doing it, and I think we have a lot of failures because of that. And I'll just speak to the example of cancer immunology, having grown up in that field and hopefully still have a drug that might make it there, but um, you know, things take time to develop and then once CTLA-4 worked, or anti-CTLA-4, and then anti-PD-1s opened up this field, every single target on a T-cell became a druggable target, absent biology behind most of those yeah, targets. Yeah. And so again, back to the unmet medical need in biology, if you don't know what it is you're trying to solve for, why do we hope that it might work in the clinic? Great points. Thank you. Matai. 
Yeah, you know, um, as the years go on to me, like, I know the answer less. I feel like at one point I knew <laughs> why there was a problem with R&D productivity. But, you know, it, ultimately, um, the most important decision of all is to work on a target or a project or not. And, you know, Sam said it really well. There, this isn't, this shouldn't be seen as a, you know, a, a, a risk decision. Um, there are, there are, I, I say the, the key to it is to make sure there are enough people in the mix in a company that have enough ability to see and connect different pieces of seemingly different uh, pieces of information from the certain categories of science which aren't always known to the same individual all the way through is there a practical way to get such a drug approved, meaning are there the right uh, endpoints to are we sure there's an actual unmet need here? That sounds crazy to say, except that that's often the problem. And you're solving a problem that um, may not be practical uh, or may not be that as important as you might think uh, when, you're, when you're way back on the early science side. So, you know, there are the, the key to R&D productivity for me is to make sure that the, the, like if there's such a special person or a few such people in the world that they come work for your company. And there's a whole bunch of things after that, of course, that we can spend time on and we should, that uh, many of those pieces, like if, you, if there is a piece of biology that uh, the right person thinks um, highly of, there's a huge problem for many of those in getting to a drug at all, in getting to an even developable candidate, because they, that's the problem I work on at FOG, for instance, where there is such biology where the, the drugability of those targets is in deep question. And, um, and there's more and more of that. That's a, a problem. So of course, like there's excellent innovation um, in that category. Um, we'll talk about it. Najat has a panel later on. We'll talk about um, artificial intelligence and research and development. But in the development side in particular, just to emphasize it for a moment, there's a lot of what I think of as relatively, where the, the data and the analytics probably exist today to, to do things uh, substantially differently than was uh, once, the, once the case. Um, and then, uh, you know, Badri and Peter Ronco and the whole team discussed uh, this morning uh, around uh, making sure our clinical trials are done in the right regions in the right way under a certain quality. I think there's massive opportunity there. So the, the sort of the efficiency and likelihood of coming through the, the, the clinical development process. I, I think there's tons of stuff to actually work on. Uh, there isn't one problem to, yeah. to cite. Um, but I just want to come back full circle to that first problem. Yeah. Like uh, the majority of programs in our industry are fortunately going to fail. And you might say, well, that's the nature of the business and that's what happens. And um, like I don't love the fast to fail, honestly, like that notion, because uh, it implies it implies something about how it works on early on where uh, you decide just to take a, a wide portfolio approach and you say, well, we need 100 things to start to get 10 into the, the clinic or something like that. And I think that's the beginning of a wrong path mm. of thinking. No, thank you, Matai. You remind me of uh, an old boss of mine once said to me, um, Martin, I don't, I don't mind if you reinvent the wheel, but please don't reinvent the flat tire. <laughs> and I think, if I think back to some of the things that we did about numbers and that, it, you know, it, it spoke to that. Andy, please. Well, I mean, I just, I, I, I fully agree with you, Matai. The, more, the longer I've been doing, the, when I started, I thought, I have the answer. It's going to be genetics. It's going to be these new modalities. It'll be better use of data. And the, the more I do this, the more I realize it's just no one silver bullet. It's, it's a lot of things. On the, I agree also, I, don't, I used to be really into fast to fail, save money, reinvest, but it it's, takes so long to get to failure. Yeah. You want to build towards success. Quick to assess. What's that? Quick to assess. Quick to assess <laughs> and, yes. qu and quick to success. <laughs> yes. But the, I remember just to, the, to your point though, um, on, on flow models, my, one of my early years in the industry, I was at Merck, and I look around the room, a lot of people cut their chops at Merck, and you spent some time there. Um, but, but we had 55 first in humans one year. Yeah, absolutely. 55. Yeah. 
guess how many made them, made it to be, be yeah, it's an easy answer because we have random guess, zero. Yeah. Zero. So, you know, that was a point where you just wanted a shots on goal model, and it clearly, it clearly doesn't work. So, I think, I don't know if Mark is in the room, but I was reading the newswire on Mark's new company, the AI company, yeah, and you had, well, what if you just get 10% better, or 20%, or maybe I'm misquoting you, Mark, or 30%. That's the kind of, that's where our big gains yeah. are. I think it's in, it's in putting these pieces together because our productivity is, is much greater today. Our ability to identify targets based on the vast knowledge that's available about human causal biology, and you speak a lot about this, Robert, our ability to leverage this diversity of modalities, it puts us in such a better position. But, the day, but we're in a different time. The, the competitive landscape is different. The, the, the kind of reimbursements in certain diseases is different. It's just harder. It's harder and harder. So we're up against different barriers. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, productivity is around cost. And the costs have just gotten so out of control, yeah. particularly in development. So I happened to be in um, China uh, mm -hmm. 10 days ago. And it, for those of you who are watching this really closely, you know, this, the China ecosystem has just taken off. And, and there's this transition that's happening from me too to innovation. Everything in China is now innovation. We'll see if this is if it's going to be successful. But if you look at their cost system, they, they, they call it a conversion factor. Yes. So for every one unit we spend, let's just talk about the US dollar, they spend one unit in China, but it's an RMB. And the the exchange rate is seven. But the cost so that means their cost of doing business in China is sevenfold less. It's just amazing. So I think if somehow we could incrementally improve our probability of success and then bring down that cost, particularly in development, and I don't know how we do that, because I'm not even sure why we pay yes. so much for development, then I think we change the calculus. Great points. I'm sure people will come back to specific questions. Jane uh, raised something that always intrigues me about how you run your businesses now, and, and I think you coined it, Jane, you know, the, the hype cycles when we prepared for this panel you know, the hype cycles, and I think it can be therapeutic areas, mechanisms, modalities, it can be processes, but you're dealing with that on a short-term basis. And then there's the kind of anti-hype, things that go out of favor for a while. I mean, I think obesity is an incredible example, having, having worked on that many years ago and failing and failing, and people moving out the area now to see what's happening because of you know, the work that Nova Nordisk and Lily in particular are doing. So how do you manage that in your organizations? I'll start with you again, Robert. You set it up that you were going to ask Jane first, but I'll, I'll, I, I, was all, I was all prepared to listen. But um, so, you know, I think you, know, you, you, you really have to believe in, in an idea, in a set of concepts. And I'll, I'll start with two things that are very near and dear to me. One is genetics and the other is immunology. And, and these are ideas that I've been thinking about for a very long time. And I know many people in the room have been thinking about these for a very long time. But like, I fundamentally believe in my bones that, that this is a good way to think about n new targets, new pathways, new, new medicines. Um, and so probably about seven or eight years ago, we thought about this, this idea of, of sequential immunotherapy to have functional mm -hmm. cures in autoimmune diseases. Um, and we kind of laid out this framework to actually you know, kind of go after that. And th there is a lot of <laughs> hype curve up and down, people actually having different levels of interest in it. And, but, but I, I fundamentally believed and continue to believe that that is a way to actually make a difference in the lives of patients. And the reason for me is that I, I used to practice clinical rheumatology and I would see these patients. And so I think having an incredibly strong belief system that's rooted in something that you think is going to be meaningful, I think is a way to kind of hold yep. on to ideas and no matter where they are on the, on the, on yep. the hype curve, you're going to continue to, to uh, persevere. And I think you know, in the last year or so, we've started to see some, some data that have come out largely out of some academic groups in Europe around being able to reset the immune system with CD19 CAR-T. And it really tells you, oh my gosh, this is, this is now possible. So I feel like you know, maybe seven or eight years ago when we thought about some of these concepts, there were some data from hematopoietic stem cell transplants and a few other experiments of nature. They say it is possible, but now you can actually see it in the framework of a healthcare system, drug 
discovery yes. in R&D system that you're like, okay, now that, that could actually become a drug. But there are ideas that we have, and I think many people in this room have, that you're like, I believe in that. And when you believe in that, you can actually sort of manage all of these other hype cycles. Oh, yeah. Robert, Robert didn't come out and say it, but you know, you did that. You did that. Like with uh, Tick 2, I remember the amount of conviction when we were at Merck together um, on the, the data spoke clearly to you, specifically to you, and, um, and it, was, it, was, it was impressive, I thought. No, but um, that's, a, that's the point. But now he's medicated. It's the point. It's the point. <laughs> he stopped speaking to you. No, but uh, that, that was really impressive because that kind of conviction held in spite of Merck's program at the time looking at um, you know, a, a form of measurement of across the four uh, jacks that wasn't revealing what you thought it should. But the, in the face of data, you know, there's tons of data, you still held that conviction over years and years and years, and now there's drug on the market. So I'm saying like that is yes. the, the key. Like you, you have enough conviction that you can hold the course yes. despite the hype being up or down. Yes. It's really hard. It's, sure, really, it's it really hard. I, it is. And you have pressure from elsewhere coming in. What are you doing about this? Jane, you read this issue. I think that's where truly dedicated scientists, if they can hold the course and you can empower them to do that, that's where you get these emergent you know, ideas or technologies or breakthroughs that can come as well. I think also, you know, we did talk on the panel before about the hype and then the anti-hype as well. It's like, how do you stay the course when everyone's in or then everyone's out? And I think, um, I don't think we have one solution for that, but we're also, I like to think about, you know, the Garnet hype curve too. Mm. Like, people come in and out of these um, hype cycles for different reasons at different times. You know, entrepreneurs are going in very early, like everyone's doing cell therapy, everyone's doing gene therapy, everyone's doing X. Um, a lot of venture capital goes into those because there's such promise. Um, and then there'll be a crash that happens with some of these until the science works itself out or the modality works itself out where a best in class or a follow on might work out, for example. I would argue that cell therapy might be in that space sure. right now too. Yes. It, it, it is a medicine, it will be a medicine across the board for certain indications, but not all of these companies are going to survive, and each one of them will incrementally, will learn something from, hopefully. Yes. How do you edit the DNA? What are the other kind of parameters you need to code into that cell? Uh, and then, you know, can you actually do it in vivo? And that's when, if we yeah. can stay the course, we can start to build on those successes and build out the right modalities and, and therapeutics. Great points, um, Jane. Andy, please. And but, then so it, it, there's two kind of themes here. One is around how we stick to something that we really believe in and not get pulled away by the, the, the vagaries of a, of, a, of a kind of a corporate mentality versus how do we not get caught up in, yeah. in a hype cycle? W which one should I take on? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Well, but I, so, okay, I'm, this one is, is, is a bit more interesting to me because I, I feel like a lot of the hype cycle comes from the outside, from a big company, from the outside in, right? It's, it's, it's nurtured in the, yes. um, and then how we prevent our kind of, you know, commercial colleagues from, you know, why aren't you in obesity? Well, it's not like you just go into obesity, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, but I think it's the key is, is how do you stick to, how do you, I mean, how do we know when to stop something versus how do we, as you did with Tick 2 Robert, how do we know when to have that conviction to continue? I think that's the judgment that is, allows us to be in the positions that we're in or, or get fired from the positions that we're in eventually. But um, I think one of the keys is, is, is that, firstly, owning it and going fast enough so that, so that you can get to an answer. Because I think operationally, when you, or when you hit road bumps that slow you down, it's hard to then convince people that, yes, but we should s still stay, stick to this. So being able to execute at speed and demonstrate that, that, that execution is really important and then getting to some clinical data, right? Because people, everybody, even our commercial colleagues respond to clinical, yep. clinical data. And I think that's, that's the key, getting there as fast as you can. And so when you're in certain areas where we just don't have those intermediate markers, then it gets really tough. I think that point is like not to be underestimated, that, yes. that, that clinical inflection point, and this is where sort of, you know, kind of teased some of our preclinical colleagues who don't necessarily understand what it takes 
to see that result in humans that tell you that's going to be a drug. And I think is where biomarkers are important, but it's just like the practical aspects of doing drug development, I think it's just, it's often underappreciated by people in research. There's another, another point, um, just to, uh, I think of this as kind of stacking the deck, it doesn't guarantee anything, but um, kind of after a period of great investment and disillusionment, you have a period where no one's interested in that anymore. Um, and you can have like a great insight during yes. that. And you can build on the last decade of all the knowledge that was built. And there's like untold number of examples like that in the, in the industry. Monoclonal like, antibodies. Th that ADCs. If you think about it, it was going to solve everything. Yes. And then, oh my goodness, it's going to solve nothing. nothing. Diagnostics at best. And then look now. So a good example. One, one great example that I've, I've talked about before, but I'm just so impressed by it, is a Novartis's uh, Entresto program. Like on the heels of neprilysin inhibitors, we, probably all of us at some level have been involved yeah. in neprilysin inhibitors, yes. failing again and again as monotherapy. Yeah. Um, then people just gave up. People just stopped. But that team... Well, there was the BMS ACE-NEP. That, that's a safety it. issue, which everybody was, oh, it'll never Everyone work and you hurt people, yeah. And then, then the, the particular insight that led to Novartis pursuing their ASNEP was pretty remarkable. ARBNEP. That was, it was ARBNEP. ARBNEP. Yeah. ARBNEP. And got like um, years, basically, like five, six, seven years ahead of everyone else. And then it was too late to catch up. But there is this general notion, I think, of investing when no one wants to. And I would say even with uh, my own company right now with peptides, there have been like two decades of really weird non-drug-like peptides that people become disillusioned with. So when a company does have some genuine insight that can see their way through to an actual medicine, you take advantage of those 10, 20 years. So it's just uh, no guarantees yes. again, but there's kind of a stacking the deck in leveraging knowledge. Yeah. Just to give the audience a warning, I'm going to open up for questions very soon. I guess another element of it is getting into something too early. And as we've discussed before, and you know, Jim Wilson being in the audience, we did our first gene therapy deal in 95 with a company called Immusol, and our second gene therapy deal in 96, 97 with a company called Megabios. And at the time, we said we're so ahead of the game. And the truth was, we really didn't know what we were doing in those days, but we were kind of so compelled by the notion of what you could do, we went into it. You must face those decisions in your portfolio, maybe a bit early for you, Jane, but how, how will you think about handling that? Yeah, well, I think we learn from the clinic, right? So we have had tremendous success with um, antisense oligos, with our relationships with partners like Ionis and others, and have learnt a lot. What we've also learned is diseases that may, this may not actually work in with the way we're delivering. So we, when we just think about it, we're providing at the moment intrathecal delivery of our ASOs and they are working beautifully with things like, you know, Tofersen that we spoke about today is the one year anniversary, Spinraza, etc. cetera. Um, um, we're also learning that the way these ASOs by distribute into the tissue and throughout the brain um, is different to what we anticipated first yes. going in and we hadn't had all the animal models to work that out in. Yes. Fast forward, this is a great modality for a certain area of, uh, uh, of the brain for diseases and not for others. And so this now opens up opportunities. So now it's like, how, what are other platforms or ways we can get to other parts of the brain with, you know, bispecifics or conjugates and we're seeing this emerging field coming out from, you know, uh, Roche is leading the way with their yes. Trant molecule for Alzheimer's disease, um, early data but exciting. Um, and, and we now know that the field has to take another step in a direction, in a modality that we know, and we know it needs to be better, into diseases that we can actually start to Definitely. crack that were undruggable. So staying on top of all of that, I think, is yes. really important. And the example you give, Ionis, or you know, previously known as ISIS, I mean, that was around 1990. Correct. This is 35 years in the making to come to where we are now, to be able to deduce those. Yep. Um, things. Um, audience, please. Bill, thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. I want to thank the, the panel. I particularly enjoy looking at uh, uh, Matai's socks, too. So, 
if that if the camera could zoom in on that that'd be, be wonderful yeah so my question deals with the the issue of high probability of, of failure or low probability of success um, I was in the business a number of years ago and we have the same uh, failure rates um, you know cancer has made it a little bit easier rare diseases have made it a little bit easier so I want to have the panel sort of opine on what is it? What, what is the fundamental problem? Okay, so one thing we know is disease is heterogeneous in etiology, okay? And yet we persist on going after single targets. Uh, we know that when we test an entity in a general population, we try to be smart and go into the right subpopulation but perhaps we're not that smart and that we miss. And I'm still convinced that there are probably a lot of drugs out there that probably would have made it if you hit it, if you hit the right subpopulation. So my question really is, is there another way to do drug discovery? We know that chemists have done pretty well. You know, you know, combi, chem, HTS, uh, you know, fragment based, all great, right? So that generally is never not the limitation. So could you, you give me a sense of that? Thank you, Bill. We, I see a couple of other hands up, so we're going to go through the panel and, you know, relatively quick answers. But Andy, why don't you start? Well, I'm curious what everybody else has to say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm curious what Andy has to say. Well, I, okay, but let me just, I'll quickly. We're all looking I actually, for the answer. <laughs> what's that? I said we're all looking for the yeah, answer. Yeah, right. I mean, I, but I really prepped. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I'll say that I, I have a slightly different take. I mean, I agree that we just, we just don't fully understand disease biology in exactly the way you articulated. But there are enough, you know, enough well-known, especially in cancer. I don't know if you were saying cancer makes it easier. Did you mean easier to fail? Because we fail more in cancer. Yeah, but they're still not helping us all that much because our failure rates are still massive. But there's still so many targets, especially in oncology, that we just fundamentally can't drug. So I think that there is a technical piece here that if we could overcome, we can make huge inroads if for exactly the reason you're articulating is because we really understand for many of these tumors that the underlying genetic drivers. Thank you, Andy. Robert? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, to me, it all comes down to not just human biology, but causal human biology. And, and the tools that we largely have available today are reductionist down to individual targets. And, and many of those tools have actually served us well. So um, oncogenic drivers in cancer. I, I actually have KRAS socks on, so I'm disappointed you didn't notice. My, these are kick, kick, kick KRAS's uh, targets. So my socks are KRAS targets. So, um, but, so we know oncogenic drivers, for example. Um, and you know, we can go through human genetics as a source for targets. But that reductionist approach to get at causality probably is not enough. And so there are there more complicated uh, ways to get at ca causality. I mean, a lot of the drugs that we actually have are pleiotropic in the ways that we don't totally understand. Um, and are there new tools? And this is where I think some of the AI tools may serve us well. So are there cellular models, for example, that we can create to do phenotypic screens to somehow get at kind of a deeper level of complexity um, from, uh, from, from causal human biology? Anyways, th those are just a couple of thoughts. I think um, I don't have an answer for this, and probably because I'm not wearing socks. <laughs> <laughs> but that um, aspect of causal biology, I think, is really interesting because this has come up a few times. Um, when we think about chronic and complex diseases, there's a lot of cross-talking going on. So there are diseases we can target by going after the causal gene or the mutation or the driver of the cancer, and even that's hard, as we know. But how do we think about tackling more complex diseases and, and when we don't know the etiology or the onset of disease, when Absolutely. you think about things like um, uh, chronic activation of the immune system, and then by the time you get to it, your body's gone through so much kind of homeostatic restat all the time that what are you actually trying to solve for beyond you know, inhibiting a TNF pathway or something Absolutely. that is really important or, or just removal of the pathogenic antibodies, which, you know, is also you know, very impactful for patients in certain diseases as well. And I think that's the challenge that we have too. And will biomarkers, for example, get us the solution for that to be able to subset heterogeneity of complex um, human disease? I think that's the kind of challenge in front of us. Matai, please. Yeah, so Thank you, Jane. This is a very good and but very complicated question. Like it's the, the overarching question is, uh, should we and how do we get towards precision medicine? Um, like, you know, how do we, how do we define disease 
um, somewhat mechanistically, uh, and how do we have a way of recognizing that subset of the disease? So, you know, there, I don't have like a, a like a ultimate answer for that, but there is like a uh, a halfway point kind of idea that we should in general try to pursue. Um, you know, and that's to that right now when we think of biomarkers, most of the world is still pursuing somewhat logical biomarkers. Like in my current world, um, beta catenin TCF drives a program. And um, you know, if the cancer is a cancer, partly because there's uh, excessive flux through that pathway, then how do you know that pathway is even on? And it could be through mutation, but sometimes there are mutations that, despite being there, the flux is low. So should you directly measure this flux? So that's a way, in a sense, of functionally yes. assessing that there's a problem. But even that, like so you can measure MYC or Axon2 or these things that are downstream of wimp beta catenin but even that doesn't work really. So what is it that helps you? And I would say you, you come to a point, and this is like where the, the gray area is, and some of you will agree with this and some not, but you come to a point where you've, your logic or your understanding of the system is not helping you. And you can reach for ready measurements at that point whether exome, transcriptome, genome, that somehow are pointing you to the right subpopulation. Um, and do you use that or not? What are the practicalities of going down that road to make a global medicine? Um, hmm. Will sequencing like that be cheap enough, available enough? So it's the gray area. I'm not saying like you should go down that every time, but to go one step past logic, I think, to me, is well worth considering. And then you don't have to stop at genomic type measurements. That makes sense in oncology yep. because it's genetic disease. But in other kinds of um, illnesses, there may very well be common measurements that are made all the time that happen to subset by mechanism. Um, Dina, if she's in the room, had uh, a really nice example within Parkinson's disease of uh, gate uh, partitioning into four groups. It wasn't clear, and I don't think it's clear to her or the team yet, that those are by mechanism. They could be other non-mechanistic kind of groupings. But those groupings, when they come, you should look into that. Because even if you don't totally understand it's one step past or a couple steps past your logic, those might be the clue to a practical way forward to precision without needing to understand all biology. So maybe in the years and years to come, there's a different and more um, satisfying solution. But that's practical yeah. in here and now. Thank you, Matai. Great points. There's a question up the back, and then we're going to come to the front. Up the back, please. Thank you. My name is Peter Mundell. Uh, I hear you with all the precision medicine. I subscribe to that, too. But think about one of my favorite drugs is metformin. Metformin works. has n and. To this day, I challenge that no one probably knows how it really works. Why am I bringing this up? We can all go into all the precision stuff that you nicely, elegant described, and I subscribe to it too, but maybe it's also a wise man said, if you want to identify a new idea, read an old book. So my argument is maybe we should go back and look for drugs that were developed in a different era that work and think, can we learn something and combine it with the modern stuff? And if you're too specific, you may lose some knowledge. Thank you. Great points. Who would like to take that? Jane, I please. think Sam's going to take that. Mike? Give Sam a mic if possible. <laughs> please. No, no, please have a have a have a mic. Thank you. Go Start on. Start over. We do know how metformin works, and if you read papers and know what you're talking about, it's important. So metformin works through a ROC2 pathway. Just so you all know, and that's why it works in metabolic disease, and that's why it works in cancer. Kind of. So it's very important to know what pathways you're looking at. But we're going to talk about cancer later. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for the question. Please, another question up the back. Yes. Thank you to the panel. Uh, very interesting and insightful discussion. 
This is Amit Gupta from Amgen. The question that I have is, uh, when I look across uh, large pharma as well as biotechs, most of them are uh, having a transformative program to accelerate the clinical trials. How do you balance the love of science where we want to go after and do invest in research, go for the most sophisticated science at the same time, how do we balance it with the operational rigor that you require in drug development? Thank you, Andy. I know you've given can, this can enormous. Can you just I heard parts of it, but I couldn't hear the whole question. So are we just mind sure. repeating the question? Okay. How do you balance the love for science versus the operational excellence that you require in the drug development? Oh, I see. The love for science and the operational excellence? We do both. Yeah. <laughs> you need both. That's why we're all here. Well, yeah. actually, I, mean, I was actually hearing the question slightly differently, and maybe I can just please answer robot, what, I, what I heard, which is, um, you know, sometimes we um, will take medicines into um, humans for the first time, and there's such an emphasis on speed in clinical development right now that you just want to recruit the right patients, get going fast to get to an endpoint. If you don't see it, you, you kind of stop. Where, where what we actually do, I think, is incredibly complicated. And I yes. think there has to be this balance of taking medicines in, into humans and, and experimenting, obviously, in a, in a very ethical and responsible way. But you're going to see things that you didn't necessarily expect. And it might not be the fastest path to getting a medicine approved, but it allows you to observe in, in, in humans in, in the context of our clinical trials. And I'm sure everyone in this room can think of examples. I mean, we have one in particular, a drug that's now called Reblazil, which was initially hmm. being developed for lytic lesions and multiple myeloma. What was observed in that uh, first clinical trial was an increase in, in red blood cell production. We went back and actually, we, it wasn't me, but at the time, cell gene scientists went back and figured out there was actually an erythroid maturation agent. You bring it forward into a different indication, and suddenly now it's an approved drug that's actually doing quite well. So I, I think there has to be this balance between speed and clinical Absolutely. trial in the ability to observe mechanistic effects in humans, and that's, that's, it's hard to get that balance right, yes. but it's one that we struggle with a lot. Yeah. I mean, there's a similar example for B cell depleters with rituximab, right? The early patients, I think it was over in the UK where um, the BCL patients getting the drug, the physicians noticed their arthritis was getting better. And so that kind of then precipitated an observational look in arthritis and, you know, that kind of spawned the whole yes. targeting B cells for autoimmune disease aspect as well. You know, I, I'm just, the, uh, so I don't know if this will resonate, but as an R&D leader, like, this is, the worst thing you can hear from your commercial colleague is, oh, that's good science. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, not that, but because then the implication of what's not being said, right? Yeah. Where's, where's this ever gonna make money, you know? Yes. And so, of course, the science is, is the yes. foundation, but, it, but there is then, the other, there are the other pieces. You do need to execute well. You do need, it does need to be relevant to the to commercially, et cetera. Can I add to that? No, there please, is, There is a kind of a person, like I mentioned before, you need someone that has a, like a SAM, basically. You need a SAM, but there are only, there's only one SAM, unfortunately. So there, you, you're for, <laughs> say, fortunately, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's another kind of person you need at the right moment in a company um, that's quite different, and that's someone that's, uh, got a winning spirit and is very product oriented. And that is a different kind of phenotype. And um, <laughs> it's, it's... Did you say Sam doesn't have a winning spirit? <laughs> I did not say that. No, but there's, a, there's sort of a, a, there's sort of a, a kind of a person yeah. that um, is competitive uh, to the point where they can foresee other people's science. You know, they can see where that, the other yes. people's potential really is and know how to carve yeah. space or to position themselves, or that's a, I feel like that's a very different kind of individual typically, yes. um, and it, 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 you take over, like in a sense, at that, uh, that proof of concept point. And it's, it's the difference between, I think like a, and this matters a lot, it's the difference between like a $200 million product and a $5 billion product. And, um, and you get one of those right, and it makes up for 10 other products, or 20 other products. So Great it's like a very important, important point. No, that is, those individuals. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to bring it back to the panel. Thank you for your questions. I know there was a few other people with their hands up. Thank you for that. Um, I ask this question every year for those in the audience. I've been around for a while, and it's about 
what's exciting you most in your own portfolio and then and then quickly what are you excited that you're seeing in other another company what's just giving you that good feel jane well i'll start because i'm next to you i think um uh biomarkers and neuroscience i think we're making great strides and that includes you know, digital biomarkers that we could really use to enable, you know, movement disorders and, and muscular disorders as well. Uh, Tissue-specific delivery, whether that be a mm. fine-tuned um, uh, tropic LNP for a gene delivery or an ADC couple to get to the right tissue. And I think not only that will be empirically worked out, but will AI will really support in the Absolutely. iterations and understanding of that as well. And then also um, the kind of undruggable protein targets as well with either, you know, advents of the right uh, targets beyond just enzyme targeting with molecular glues and, and, and derivatives of that, um, as well as targeting proteins on the surface of cells for degradation and that in, in this space as well. And, and I'm a big fan of cell therapy. It's here to stay. Yeah. We just have to, for autoimmune disease, move beyond just lupus nephritis. Thank you. Robert, 10 seconds. Uh, resetting the immune system and autoimmune disease is something that we're actually doing. I think something that we're not doing, but I'm really, really interested is this concept of programmable therapeutics for rare diseases, so the ability to actually have something that can go and you can basically re 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 you know, take out the cassette and do it again and again and again. You've got a tiny portfolio, Matai, compared to what you had, but what's most exciting? Well, talk about other, other portfolios. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, I am, I want to just reiterate the, the glue idea for a moment. Mm. Um, you know, we don't work on that within FOG, but the notion of using uh, another protein to add to binding energy and specificity and the RevMed, KRAS, I mean, the PANRAS molecule is awfully interesting. Uh, and I think that should inspire um, uh, new ways forward for lots of proteins, uh, lots of targets that are otherwise just a source of frustration for R&D heads. Thank you. Last word, Andy. Uh, our Rexin 2 receptor agonist to functionally cure narcolepsy yeah. will present data in, in June. And then I think the GLP-1s are just changing fundamentally the society in which we live outside of our portfolio. Thank you all for a great panel. Thank you.